So please let me invite uh, Baroness Amos to offer us a few welcome remarks before I hand over to Professor Badri. Valerie. Uh, we know thank you very much and uh, can I thank everyone who has joined uh, the session for this afternoon's discussion on the future of African and UK higher education institutions post-COVID-19. It is an absolutely apt uh, topic. Um, as you mentioned, Awino, this roundtable is the official launch of the Africa at SOAS review report, which I commissioned, and I would like to thank you and uh, the other co-chair, Professor Badarin, as well as the review panel members for your thorough and wide-ranging review, which I think captured the range of issues SOAS needs to address to build on its history of research, teaching and scholarship on issues in the people, countries and the diaspora uh, of the African continent. The world is changing rapidly. We've all been watching this over the last few years. And of course, COVID-19 and its impact is very much a part of that. SOAS, I think, is very well placed, given the interdisciplinary nature of our work, our subject and geographic expertise, but also, crucially, our commitment to decolonization and to learning from mistakes which have been made in other parts of the world, uh, the critique that we have uh, of current practice in many parts of the world, to engage in meaningful collaboration and partnership with colleagues, not only from the African continent, but from elsewhere in the world. As African and UK universities grapple with the challenges posed by COVID-19 and the pandemic. I don't think that higher education will be the same as we go forward. And I very much look forward to this afternoon's uh, discussion and the issues which will be raised. Thank you again to you, uh, Awino, to Mashoud, and to the other panel members for your report. Thank you very much, Valerie. Uh, Mashoud, I'll now invite you to offer a brief summary of the findings of the report. Uh, thank you very much, I mean, Awino. And, uh... We, we have had a long discussion at SOAS about the in SOAS, in, in SOAS and about the need to enhance uh, our engagement on and in Africa. But I mean, many of us who have engaged in this know that we have just talked about it, we have debated about it, but for a long time, nothing was done about it. So for this reason, uh, I and uh, I mean, on behalf of myself and uh, we know my coach here, we thank Valerie for initiating uh, this formal review uh, on Africa at SUAS, which was launched in January, and which has resulted in this, I mean, uh, uh, report. Now, um, so many people have been uh, helpful in getting this report out. The report itself is, I mean, explanatory, it speaks to itself. So I will just go through a, a few things, I mean, uh, on it. I, might, I must also put on record um, that we had a very, as uh, research assistants who really helped a lot, and also the other panel members. Now, we went into this uh, uh, review with certain assumptions, and you'll find this uh, uh, in the report. Many of these assumptions, I believe, some of us know already. But the truth is that, I mean, at least the report, since it was carried out based on evidence and also, I mean, facts, it uh, establishes perhaps maybe what we know before on facts, and therefore, we can go forward to be able to uh, um, um, work well on those facts. Now, we looked at four main areas. The first one is curriculum, curriculum review. The second is on studentship and staffing. Then we looked at the issue of partnerships in and on Africa, and also the question of uh, 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 an Africa Institute uh, at SOAS. The report talks about our methodology, then the findings and the recommendations. Now, I mean, the findings on each of uh, the, the, the four legs, I mean, are quite clear. We find out that, I mean, some of the assumptions we went in with about our curriculum was that we had so many good, I mean, modules, so many good courses at SOAS on Africa, but we call them, I mean, we identify them as what we call scattered gems. They were all over the place. They were not, I mean, students do come and take uh, modules, I mean, relating to Africa in different departments, 
but these were not really very well coordinated and organized. And we thought that perhaps, I mean, uh, there's a need uh, to um, uh, coordinate, I mean, uh, our models and our curriculum, I mean, properly. Um, and also we thought that, I mean, in some instances with the interviews we had with students, some of the expectations of students who come to SOAS, particularly in relation to, I mean, study in Africa. Sometimes students were disappointed about what they found, particular in relation to, I mean, Moodle content and, and so on and so forth. And we have given recommendations on, on how that needs to be done. Now, I mean, in relation to Africa studies, we also identified the fact that, well, I mean, so are still, I mean, we are still perhaps maybe stuck in the context of, I mean, restricting Africa studies to issues of language, culture, rather than moving forward, I mean, and putting in place uh, much more uh, um, cross-disciplinary uh, models in that regard. And we, we indicate uh, um, our findings on that as well for us to be able to, to move forward on that. Then the issue of, I mean, uh, studentship and staffing. Now we uh, also identified the fact that, well, we need to do a little bit more. We need to be much more proactive in relation to attracting uh, uh, more students and also increase our staff, I mean, who work specifically on, on, on Africa. Now on partnerships, partnerships, as we know, are very, very important in relation to uh, the existence of our higher educational institutions. And I mean, we found out that, um, uh, yes, we have individuals who have, I mean, partnership relationships with other academic colleagues in other African universities. But our institutional partnership arrangements uh, was really very uh, uh, woolly in, in many places. And we identified the fact that, I mean, there's a need to be much more proactive in this, in this regard. It was interesting, really, to identify, speaking to, I mean, other uh, um, African institutions and other stakeholders, we identified that the interest of African universities really to engage with UK universities. But a lot of the time, the proactiveness come from the African universities themselves rather than from UK universities. And we, I mean, identify the fact that SOAS needed to do much more on that. Um, and lastly, the Africa Institute, I mean, the debate has been on for, for a while. And we had a lot of interviews, particularly with the directors of the other institutes in, at SOAS. And the question was not about whether we should have an institute. Everybody was, I mean, on that, I mean, there is a need, both politically and academically, to have an Africa Institute at SOAS. But the question was how were we to have it? And then after going to, I mean, a lot of, I mean, deliberations, we made a suggestion on how to go forward on this. I mean, looking at what other institutions are, are doing in that regard. Now, the report, as you see, I mean, clearly identifies the need for SOAS to be radically and more proactive in its engagement on and in Africa to sustain its acclaimed leadership, you know, in this area of study. We hope that the report sets out some general strategic recommendations to get that done. And the, I mean, roundtable today, I believe, will perhaps, I mean, also provide us insights on how to move on much more, I mean, specifically on those general strategic I mean, recommendations that the, the, uh, the, uh, the, recommend, the report provides. So once again, thank you very much, I mean, uh, Valerie for really initiating this. It's going to be one of your legacies after you have left SOAS. Thank you very much for doing this. And we hope you can take this forward. I must also thank, I mean, our incoming um, um, director, Professor um, Adam Hadid, for his expressed interest in seeing that this, I mean, report is implemented. So we hope down the road, I mean, uh, we'll be able to really consolidate and enhance our engagement on and in Africa as, uh, as it need to be. Thank you very much, Awino, for your co-chairship and also all our other members for their uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you, Mashud. And let me just acknowledge Lutz Martin, who I know is here, and Marie Rode, if you're here, those were other members of the review panel from SOAS. So let me start off the discussion uh, that sort of deepens one of the key findings in, the, in, in terms of the landscape analysis of the higher education uh, sector, if you will, both on the African continent, but also in the UK where we are located. And the, one of the central questions was around, of course, partnerships and where universities are going. But this, as we know, has been complicated by COVID-19. And so, uh, Adam, I'm going to start off with you since Paul is not here yet, and ask what are the sets of questions that COVID-19 has raised for you at BITS in South Africa, in the, 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 in the continent much more generally, because I know you're also a, a member of AROAD. So uh, firstly, thank you, Awino, for, for, for uh, chairing this. Thank you, Mashud, for producing this in, uh, review. 
to Valerie for initiating the review. So thank you to all of the colleagues. Uh, to respond to your question directly, uh, perhaps I should say, you know, for a long time, we've been saying that many of the challenges of our world is transnational in character. I think what COVID-19 has done is it's brought it to the fore. And it demonstrates in a very real way, we succeed in addressing this pandemic, this transnational challenge as a human community, or we don't succeed as all. Well. However well the British do in fix and addressing the pandemic, or the Americans, or the Chinese, so long as it is playing out on the African continent, or in Asia, or Latin America, it can very easily go back to the UK or the US, etc. We in it together, or we in it, uh, or we not in it at all. And it seems to me that that's what the pandemic has done. And whether you look at all of our other challenges, whether it's climate change, inequality, political and social, all of these are transnational challenges. And I think that's what this has brought to the fore. And from a British perspective. It's, it's forced us to respond in two ways that I think is going to be inevitable for higher education. One is the shift to online. And if you're going to shift to online, you have to address in South Africa the deep inequalities in South Africa. You have to address online and mitigate the consequences for poor people going online as much as you do it for rich. And that's the first thing, how to do online in deeply unequal contexts. The second is it's put the issue of global partnerships on the table. Because effectively, if we are going to address the global challenges of our time, we do need human resource capacities across the world, and we need institutional capacities across the world. And frankly, to be honest, our global partnerships for the last 30 years has been directed at individuals. It's about taking talented people and moving them to London and New York and Beijing and giving them a good education. But we lose many of them and we weaken the institution on the continent. And it seems to me what this pandemic does and what this review report puts on the table very firmly is that we need to reimagine global partnerships in an institutional sense, not in an individual sense, because that's how we're going to address the global challenges of our time. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Adam. Let me turn to you, Fumi. Uh, so you're sitting in the UK. Uh, we, we all know you're, uh, you're in an institution that's relatively uh, more financially uh, viable uh, or, or you know, more robust, if you will, uh, than ours. Have you faced, would you argue that you faced the same sort of concerns that uh, a VITS would face or a SOAS would face in terms of responding to COVID-19? And what would that be? A very, very profound question. If we think about the impact of COVID uh, from the perspective of UK institutions, I have to say, first and foremost, uh, robust, one can say, but what is our uh, you know, financial viability in the age of COVID? I don't think that many institutions in the UK, apart from Oxford and Cambridge, perhaps I can say, yes, there's financial buoyancy uh, in that way. We all face the same sort of challenges. Uh, but there are two things. I think there's confluence, you know, that there's a confluence of factors that, you know, I have observed when it comes to impact of COVID. Uh, the first is, uh, it relates to what I talked about. Online education is no longer that kind of thing that you do uh, as a luxury. Uh, and it brings uh, forth immediately all sorts of inequalities. Um, but I, I think that's number one, of course, in the UK, uh, with the uh, economies of, or, or the economics of, of education, if I may say so, almost every one of us in London and in the Russell Group is thinking about how do you do education differently and still be, you know, and reach your uh, all your clusters, all the variety, variety and the diversities of, of, of the of international students. That is one set of issues. But I want to come to that impact on partnerships, on academic uh, institutional partnerships uh, that Adam was talking about. As where Africa is concerned, 
I think we've always been elitist in our approach to, and I'm not talking about Keynes, I'm talking across the board, uh, in this case, in our approach to institutional partnerships. We want to marry the best institutions in the world, and we rank those institutions in particular ways. And I don't, and I think many, many uh, places, many UK universities are, are guilty of running to South Africa very quickly. Even in South Africa, you see how all of the inequalities are laid bare. I dare say that they, they, you know, they're doing far better than the rest of the continent when you're talking about access to education at this particular moment. So I think that if we're now going to go to the next level post-COVID in terms of partnerships, we have to think about ethos and social responsibility, the questions of decolonizing uh, the academy that, ha you know, those questions have been on the table for a long time. But there's a lot of urgency uh, about those questions. Uh, George Floyd, alongside the, the differential impact of COVID, has done something really profound to the United Kingdom uh, and uh, United Kingdom's institutions, and not least the US and the rest of the global north. And it raises questions about how we will begin to partner with the global south. And I think it has to be excellence plus social responsibility going forward. If we're going to partner with African institutions, we have to look at equal partnerships that will do two things. One, are we helping them? Are we being socially responsible, helping them uh, and helping us to improve access to education? Two, are we really partnering to deliver the same quality of education that our students get in London? If that's not what we're doing, and it's just about partnering for research uh, funding, which has always been unequal, whichever way, talk to any of our partners in the Global South, is the same consistent set of issues that they raise about research partnerships. But those research partnerships are not enough. They have to change. The, the education partnerships we have to pay attention to because we have to fuse the ability to reach every single excellent student in any corner of the continent of Africa where they may be, and marry that with excellent students in the UK. Now, ethos has everything to do with it, because if we are serious about decolonizing the academy in the UK, we have to partner in a way that allows that decolonization uh, not to repeat itself in Africa. Africa is beginning to have its own conversation about what decolonization means, because our academies are fused very tightly with the Eurocentric um, you know, ideas, ways of teaching, ways of learning. And we have to unlearn that in Africa as we have to do in Europe. And I think that is the first question that we have to address going forward. And if not for COVID, we will not be having these conversations at all this, in this way at this particular time. Thanks. Thanks, Fumi. I'll circle back to you shortly, but let me bring Brian here very quickly. So Brian, uh, I want to pick up on this point of social responsibility, questions of access. Now, you have uh, talked quite extensively about the different ways in which African governments have responded to questions of COVID-19. At the institution where you sit, you're very interested in ideas of knowledge production. What do you see as the connection between higher education institutions, whether they're on the African continent or in the United Kingdom, such as ourselves, and the constituencies that you're interested in and the movements that you want to support? Um, first, I think to agree with Adam and uh, Fumi that this moment allows for introspection, uh, partly because the coalition of lies has uh, broken down of itself, whether it is lies about certain ideological uh, class, uh, racial interests, on how you do education whether it is notions of how the Western Academy would help civilize its African junior partner. All this has collapsed. Uh, um, and in that collapse, I think what it has exposed, that we know, is the crisis of the African intelligentsia and African intellectual, who have become a client class for Western, and by Western, it's French, American, Canadian, and uh, European um, and also it exposes the racism of financing for higher education, whether by private uh, institutions or by public institutions. In the sense that 
the rush to South Africa and to those African countries where the tourism is good, Ghana, Kenya, uh, Egypt, had nothing to do with stability of the country, but more to do with the exotic interest uh, of those who would be the dominant partners in the research uh, company. So it would mean if, if the constituencies we work on are not just interested in a conversation on decolonization, because that can become a sterile uh, social cultural uh, uh, conversation purely about uh, black nationalism. The interest, as Adam and Fumi have pointed out, is in both economic structural transformation, which would speak to a holistic institutional uh, transformation. It is possible to have a very robust Africa Studies department in a benignly racist institution and to become a ghetto of excellence. And it is important that we don't reduce ourselves to this book. Uh, and as a result, it essentially means we are asking much more radical questions, not about just modernization, not about uh, whitewashing the anti-racism struggle by getting white folk to feel bad and therefore talk right uh, and behave right. This is about the power is carried through ideas and institutions, but it is also carried through economies and money. So the politics of money, we cannot change the ecosystem of, the, of higher education without changing how it is financed but without changing, as your reporters rightly say, what we teach, why we teach it. And in certain instances, let me observe that when British institutions, higher education institutions, were intended to be progressive, it was in order to champion the interests of British trade. So it was linked to the British foreign policy objective, building good relations with a particular country uh, that had significant trade with the British. And that is, well, part colonial, neo-colonial, but also part of the crisis of marketization. You will not address access through just getting a mass of Africans into the system and then creating an industry uh, of what Braithwaite and Drawers called model missionaries or model mercenaries, right? People who would be good English uh, uh, anglo likes right? If this, if there's any radicalism to this movement, to what your report suggests, it is not the creation of a gate of excellence of black education or African education in the United Kingdom. It is creating an ecosystem where we enable Africans to study not just Africa, but to also study other continents and build strategies for engagement with such other continents. So the knowledge is not simply to go beyond the cultural understanding of Africa to an economic understanding of Africa through the same imperial lens, where Africa is either a problem, an investment opportunity, or a charity. So the radicalism of this conversation is in what Adam and Fumi have suggested. It's not just access in terms of the tools. It is, I don't want to participate if my idea will not frame what is being done. So because it's possible to have many black faces increase, go beyond 50%, and simply to become echoes in imperial uh, clothing. So I hope for funders, uh, for everybody else, this is not a moment of a quick cultural fix. This is a moment for us to conceptualize what does a structural uh, transformation of the historical ways of not just partnering, but of teaching about Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Adam, let me come back to you and pick up on this idea of the transnational, which Brian is also talking about when he, when he invokes the idea of an ecosystem. And I'm wondering, uh, as you transition to the UK at, uh, you know, in January uh, to join SOAS, and as you think about the current uh, pan-African engagements that you have had with the RUA and the Guild and others, how do you think these particular kinds of partnerships respond to the question of financing for higher education? And what more can be done? So, you know, I think Brian uh, highlights what is a essentially a challenging dilemma. 
And that is how do you create equal partnerships in an unequal world? And if we don't figure that out, all we'll do is a new version of the old. Now, let me, as I understand, not only British higher education, but British US, perhaps Australian higher education, and South Africa tried for a while around this, didn't succeed. And it's really uh, a model that says, we're going to bring the best of the world to our institutions and train them. We're going to charge them three times what we charge domestic students. We're going to make a lot of money out of it. We're going to cover our expenditure. And that all will be packaged as a global social good. We are training everybody else. Now, there's a, a number of problems with that, one of which is people don't go back because life happens. Two, is in, uh, institutions get impoverished in the other side because actually the money is going one way. And three, uh, effectively, you teach a very sanitized version of whatever you're teaching because you teach it from the lens of a particular geographic space. And all of that is essentially compromises the education project, but it also compromises the social justice project globally. And increasingly, my argument is, and I think many people's argument, is this is not a good thing for Africa. Actually, it's a good thing for the world, because if Africa continues, or the developing world continues to labor the, belabor these problems, actually, it will sooner or later come to haunt the citizens in Europe, in the UK, in, 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 in the United States, etc. And so the big debate for me is we've got to rethink the business model. We've got to rethink the business model, not only of high British higher education, but also African higher education. And unless the money flows both ways, all of the talk about social good is nonsensical because it's not real, it's rhetorical. And that means we have to completely reimagine. For a place like SOAS, the idea is it's not about bringing Africans and Asians and Middle Eastern and people from Latin America to SOAS and charging them $20,000. It's actually how do we use SOAS with Ghana, Legon, or Makarere, or Nairobi, or Dar es Salaam, or UCT, or WITS to rethink training and on the basis of that, rethink the business model so it flows both ways and is able to cover the expenditure both ways. And that's as important for as it is for kings and all of us. So that's the first big thing that I think we need to think about. And I think that Arua is essentially about that, is our conversations with the Guild of European Universities, the European Guild of Universities, was don't think you're going to do what has happened before. We want to reimagine the way we partner. I also think one final point I want to make is how we teach us to change. Because I think Brian was touching on this as well. We need to reimagine learning. Are we going to breach the very disciplinary boundaries that we've inherited for the last 80, 100 years? Because actually, you know, if you want to do a course on public health, or how to address pandemics. You can't address it simply from the perspective of tropical medicine or, frankly, uh, public health narrowly. You have to understand the social dimensions that enable pandemics not to be addressed in the multiplicity of social contexts. Within it. So we need to breach the very disciplinary boundaries on how we teach, what we teach, when we teach and that it seems to me is what this pandemic brings to the world and that's the other thing that arua is talking about and 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 raising in the kinds of engagements we are having with the uk and with many other parts of the world thank you thanks adam let me circle back to you for me uh, and i want to pick up on the question of inequalities but uh, to examine it from the uk context I think that one of the questions that COVID-19 has raised uh, for UK universities is the need to turn their focus inward, right? To think less about uh, the loss of income from international students, 
but to be much more attentive to our students from what in, in this context are known as BME students and, uh, and how we create institutions that allow the students to thrive. Now, without uh, revealing too much about King's strategy, what would you comment uh, in relation to this in terms of you know, broad responses that you might be privy to? No, no, I, I think, um, you know, I have to say that a core part of King's strategy, uh, the one big factor for us is we understand we cannot do this alone. So it has to be in partnership. But for the first time in partnership with the like-minded, not just because uh, we need to be in partnership with the so-called uh, so -called world-class universities. We're beginning to find out that uh, the rank is not what matters most because you can open inside those institutions that have such, you know, uh, that can say they have such high ranks and they ring hollow in terms of values, in terms of those values uh, that allow you to solve global problems permanently, but that allow you to be culturally competent. Uh, and so, so a big thing for us at King's is that we want to choose our partners wisely. But towards what end though? Because when you look at the recurring problem across the United Kingdom, uh, the, 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 the issue is a matter uh, of degree, not of substance. Which true, we opened our doors. I'm sure SOAS did, many of us in, in London in particular did, to our students from our inner, you know, London communities and so on. And I, I don't know about you, but we now have at least half of our home students who are from the BME background. So we have done that. It's not enough to say uh, we have these numbers of students in our base. It is what we do with the diversity of our campus that has now uh, become very clear. It's become a, an issue of you know, dire urgency because if those students come to our campus and they do not feel a sense of belonging, they do not even feel sometimes, uh, and, and I've taken the, the temperature of this uh, across as many universities as I can uh, because I, I came into this role and I had to study my own campus from below and across and I had to study a couple of other institutions as well. We're not doing too well when uh, we uh, look at the experiences of our, of our BAME our students. We've brought them into a place where the decolonized uh, nature of the entity is beginning to affect their own success. We see that seep, out, uh, seep through in the black attainment gap, but more importantly, we cannot even give them value for money if we cannot go and deep dig into, you know, deep into the curriculum to bring out experiences that reflect their own worlds so that we can truly have a plurality of ideas in the classroom, outside of the classroom. It's a big issue. And I think we're facing it now. Uh, we have to face it squarely for the first time. But what many of my colleagues, whether within Kings or outside of Kings would ask us typically is that even when we look inward, we want to do something, all right? We've done this for a long time. They ask, what do we do? And I think we spend so much time as, you know, talking about what's wrong with the system. We will not always agree, uh, but many people now agree that yes, there's something fundamentally wrong with the system. If a, a chunk of our population within and outside the university feels really um, that the outcomes for them, and we can see the outcomes, the outcomes do not look good for them. So I think it requires a partnership that does three things. One, and I know that sustainability is a very big uh, issue here, but that first aspect of the partnership is a collective agreement that our, all of our subjects across disciplines, uh, those in the natural sciences will say, how on earth can you decolonize mathematics, uh, physics, or, you know, sometimes we even say it's the English legal system. What do you want us to do about it? It is English. That's why the question of what, what we teach, but especially how we teach is important. Pedagogy is at the core of it. But even in what we teach, a little tweaking, like bringing history to the fore, history of the discipline to the fore uh, of the program content is an important starting point. So it's not enough to say to someone, uh, in my own uh, program, uh, I've had a couple of students ask me, uh, uh, this international peace and security, there are not many African women on the reading list. It, it struck me that I had to go back to the history of, 
of uh, security studies on the continent of Africa. When I was growing up, when I did my first degree uh, in Nigeria, uh, it was difficult to find a civilian in the first instance, even teaching this. You didn't find it on the, in the curriculum. Civilians didn't teach it. And as they would refer to them, bloody civilians at the time, nor did you find a woman uh, teaching it anywhere. So how do you expect to find literature on this that dates back 50 years? You can't. That has helped me a lot. But how you teach it, it's not enough to simply say physics is not designed in that way. Uh, you have to find what appeals culturally uh, in an environment. We know why some of our Indian students are, are some of the best uh, in the area of, of natural and mathematical sciences. Why do they learn? How do they learn? What makes them learn the way they do? I, I think there's practical work to be done in the UK. But the second thing I'd like to really uh, put to the table is, therefore, if we're going to have successful partnerships, I agree totally with Adam, you know, sitting where I sit, uh, you have to first think of the financial viability of the institution. But why are we thinking about the financial viability of our institution and we're not thinking about the financial viability of the people we're partnering with? So I understand, you know, profoundly that we need to bring the best of Africa and the best of the UK together in terms of academic institutions. And actually, we have different things of value that we can exchange for that. And the online space actually makes it makes this the best time to do that. For the first time, I can have a dual degree, um, which, you know, half of it is online because my people in Africa might not be able to come here for a full year and afford to live in London. And yet I have people here whom I want to go and do that other half in Africa if they like. So we have not had these questions in this same way before, because if you really count, not many UK universities have dual or joint degrees with uh, a whole range of African universities. Now, what is the outcome that we seek? And this is my last point on this. That outcome has to be about the quality, the outcome for the graduate, the quality of these individuals that we produce. Because let's face it, even some of the best institutions in Africa are producing a particular kind of barren elite. They have no social, they have no conscience. It's a global issue. We are contributing to a global elite system which builds inequality fundamentally into the structures of education. And they go out into the world understanding um, that they have an entitlement to rip off the rest of the world. Those are the kinds of graduates producing. I'm not saying that there are no exceptions. And that's why it doesn't matter who comes onto our campuses in the UK from the African continent. If they can afford 20,000 pounds, they really are probably not the poorest in their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Like. Thank you so much. There are two questions for you, but I want you to write them down and I want to go to Brian and then come back to the rest. The first question was how King's has managed to do what you're saying you've done in terms of increasing the number of BME or black students within amongst your home students. So how have you managed to increase that percentage to 50%? And the second question, which is for all the panelists, uh, is around whether simply changing the curriculum will resolve uh, the broader questions of attainment gap from, for BME or black students. Brian, I want to come to you as uh, Fumi and Adam think about these two questions. You talked about the ghetto of, uh, let me look at that, I wrote it down somewhere, the ghetto of African studies. <laughs> um, and I want to ask, to ask you that if you were to offer us a proposal, so for instance, one of the things that our report talks to is uh, creating an Africa Institute. Now, Habib, in our discussions with him, raised questions around this as well. So I'm certain that when you talked about the ghetto, uh, he was uh, a little happy. Um, what would you offer? What, what, how would you imagine uh, a space for critical thinking around African questions um, in relation to global challenges and in relation to the global community when folks are sitting in the heart of the empire? Because this is the challenge that we have to confront as well. Uh, we have people traveling to our institutions who say they want to understand the continent. They say they want to understand contemporary issues. How do you frame that without losing the essence of what we want to talk about? Well, um, let's start off by saying the 
you sit in a, on an island uh, with less than 60 million people and you are studying my continent with 1.3 billion people and you want to build a desk with uh, 10 people or nine people uh, and uh, those people are supposed to study everything from our science to uh, uh, our economies right and i'm not saying that quantity uh, is what matters uh, for me the you the island you are sitting on has no real basis of existence without my continent and uh, uh, india and asia so in essence uh, my sense is it is not uh, uh, just an africa studies center everything that informs your being now that we have uh, defrocked the pretense of empire right uh, and uh, uh, how in, in a very uh, vile racist way it went about destroying African civilization. I think that if you want to turn, invert the order of study, you would have to deal with two things. To what extent is Africa and the understanding of the world, between ourselves and Asia, I suspect we constitute more than 50% of the global population, so, uh, and in economic terms, going into the future, we constitute more than 70%. So your island is in danger of extinction uh, epistemically, intellectually. It's in danger of extinction economically. Uh, it's only because of historical stupidity that our people have looked. They, I mean, I, I do understand. Uh, but if I'm to restructure this, uh, I would be more realistic about where power lies, right? It has historically lain there, and COVID has shown. I was uh, saying to somebody that the entire African debts from COVID are less than 40% of UK debts. You are supposed to have better health infrastructure. You took all our health workers that we trained on public money. You took them out to the United Kingdom. You pay them pittance, right? All that reality should tell you something about I don't see how you can understand tropical disease. I don't see how you can understand global security. I don't see how you can understand future of economies without talking of structural integration, which may or may not include an Africa center, but structural integration throughout. Because I don't see the future of the island you are sitting on if it does not engage in a robust way uh, with the 4 billion Asians and 1.3 billion Africans. And these represent not just physical bodies or minerals that can be mined, they represent the future of global intell intellectual development. Mm -hmm. So my sense is you would need to do an integration, and that integration is reflected in budget, that integration is reflected in personality, that integration is reflected in content, cutting across all departments. If for purposes of... Uh, 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 and it's transdisciplinary because your analysis has to be transdisciplinary for you to understand uh, the, the continent, for you to understand fully what the opportunities for transformation are. If the purpose of the African Center is to coordinate the transdisciplinarity uh, of African learning that's happening and to reorient all other departments to understand the continent, not from the colonial perspective of a problem, an opportunity, a curiosity, I would I'd understand that, right? Uh, and, and so I would think, and part of the problem of Africa's ghettoization and study, that if it makes no sense for British investments and other related, uh, you will not have public investment. If you don't have some British international charity do-gooder who's interested, uh, in picking up poor kids and poverty pornography where kids have flies on their face, you will not get any funding, right? And so if we're going into the future where Africa is seen as a solution giver, as a knowledge giver, I would say integration is the one approach, right? I, I'm worried about assimilation. So, you know, when I talk about a ghetto, is that um, racism by its nature has been very adaptable. Adam will tell you that when South African uh, whites did not want to deal with South African blacks, they reached out to the rest of the neighboring countries and brought them. 
And this had nothing to do with their respect for the black from neighboring countries. It had something to do with their refusal to address the structural questions around equality, around inclusion, around diversity. You can't do diversity purely by uh, recognition. Otherwise, it would be as pejorative and rude as going to a racist and they say to you, I have a black friend, or going to a sexist and they say, I have a mother. I think the fundamental question we are facing here is Africa must be given its place, not as an act of charity, not simply because George Floyd died. It must be given its place because Britain stands. Britain is because of ourselves and India and the rest of the Asian country. So SOAS represents, as do kings and other colleges, that change in narrative, that's not simply asking to be recognized, but that's asking, there is a reparative imperative in this. If we talk about this in apologetic terms, we will end up with this vile sense that says, if the British taxpayer cannot, under, cannot afford it, we can't do it. Well, you know, and that's not the basis of this conversation, right? Of all that's been stolen from the continent and continuously so, through British foreign policy, some of the racism that British foreign policy will promote, even as it does charity, some of the most repressive, oppressive, and some of the most extractive forms of policies that have been forced on us from Thatcher to uh, wherever. I'm, I, as an African, I'm not asking for British charity. In fact, this is a courteous requirement that, look, pay reparations. The one way you can do reparations is simple. Return resources, expertise, technologies to build the institutions that you plundered. Return the arts, the knowledge that you plundered. If you don't follow it on a reparative uh, imperative, what will happen now, you know, is your generation will get an African center right? And you'll get some budget. And you run for five years. Adam will have come. You run for five, six years. Afterwards, the cost question will come because it was not a structural change, was not an attitudinal change. It was not even an ideological shift. What it was is the shame of one court with their hand in the cookie jar. People have just have been discovered that for, his, for many years, you've sustained a racist facade. So in order to purge our conscience of any responsibility without transformation, we will allow the natives to set up a native center. <laughs> you will also have given us uh, some money, Brian, for that native center. But having said that, um, I want to add two more questions to Adam and uh, Fumi. One is around your views on joint or dual PhD schemes and what opportunities those offer. And another is a question around um, connections to diasporan communities that links back to the point you made for me about the nature of education, um, the kind of education that is still you know, uh, existing in, in many of our universities, including, including those where I studied myself in Africa. Let me start with Adam. No, actually, let me start with Fumi and then come back to Adam because we will close after that. Uh, Fumi? Thank you. Thanks, Awino. Let me just very quickly talk about the first question that you asked. Why, how come we ended up with more than 50% of uh, our home students uh, coming from, I mean, uh, coming from BME communities? There's a history to it, and I won't tell that history, but just allude to it. 2001 was the time that Kings, uh, through the extended, the, the extended medical degree uh, program, uh, brought in students from across the UK, uh, from minority groups, many of them were the first to come to uni to go to universities and their families by by having a six-year program instead of a five-year program. So you spend the first year just trying to help them, bring them to the level, the, uh, accepting that structural factors uh, have created these kinds of inequalities where they would never really come onto our campuses if we don't do something about it, and therefore they spend six years instead of five. Of course. For so-called world-class universities, this lowers your tariff, and you know that. So you're going to have to bear some brunt of it, and so on and so forth. Uh, other things have happened since then, but we that that was a very clear 
a starting point for us. So you find many of our BME students are from the health schools, but you also find um, many from other faculties as well. Uh, there's some faculties where you're not going to find many of them. Arts and humanities being an example. There are quite a few, but I'm talking about in large numbers. So, so I'll leave that aside. But when you talk about African dual degree, I, I want to talk about dual degree and not degree. Uh, it's not just a matter of semantics. There is a difference between both of them. On joint degree programs, the quality question, the fact that you're providing exactly the same degree uh, to that student, albeit with two, um, uh, if you like, with two brands on it, that is always so difficult to come by. It's probably easier for joint PhDs, but you're not going to get very large numbers on the basis on, on the current business model. But dual degrees, I almost say as an imperative, um, we have that with a, a, a several U European universities where they spend half the time with us at King's uh, on, on a master's program, on a two-year master's. We run a one-year master's like yourselves. Uh, they can spend a year at King's. Now you can do it online is what I'm trying to say. It's not very uh, popular, but you can do it online if you're trying to ensure this access and this equality that we're talking about. And then they spend a year at their place, they get two, two certificates uh, for those two years. Uh, and these are programs that have been run in many other parts of the world. There are very few of them, whether at undergraduate or master's level with African universities, for the same reasons I was talking about later. If we think of the future, though, a bit of pragmatism, I, of course, align myself completely with uh, uh, Brian's points. But in order to deal with this structural uh, transformation, finally, we have to put some pragmatism in it. If Africans are not go cap in hand, they have to use what matters, what, what is of greatest value in there. And they, that's their natural resources. Uh, and you see how it's been used of late in a negative way. It's the land, it's the people, it's the mineral resources. Those people means that the average age of 19, uh, you know, that you have in Africa, in 2035, by 2035, Africa will have the largest online market globally. The advantage for a place like SOAS, I dare say for a place like my own institution because of the programs in place, is that because we have addressed the question of values first, we will be the first to begin to transform that relationship, partnerships on the continent in the ways that uh, I believe Adam and, uh, and Brian were talking about. That has to precede anything else. Because of those values and those African institutions themselves, they're not saints. Our institutions on the continent are not saints. They have really rigidly adhered to a colonial legacy of Eurocentric education and produced graduates that are you know, usually not relevant to their society. So if we start on the basis of ethos, we put content that works for both, and we allow the means to play its role if it's online, that education that can people can stay on the continent, also avoid brain drain, take that online education. But we are all, as academics, partnering in very equitable ways and changing the face of education. That's the way of the future. Because we're thinking about this first, I assume you're thinking about it because of your decolonization agenda. And if you are, then stepping into that continent basis of a different partnership is the way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Adam? So I want to make quick four quick points. I mean, the first is what Unmi said, uh, and I entirely agree with her on what she said around dual PhDs. I would imagine we would want to go at other kinds of le levels of the degree, masters, etc. But what she also said that I want to underscore, none of this works unless we rethink the business model. Mm. And the business model has to un the benefits have to go in both directions or you're not going to create a sustainable sustainable model for this so that's the first thing i would say the second on the diaspora i absolutely think we need to work very strongly with the diaspora but you know i just came from a conversation in the african union and one of the big issues i raised there was we got to think about how we work with the diaspora because too many of these diaspora programs is somebody coming for three weeks, hanging around in the middle of Ghana, Legon, or Lagos, and then buggering off and saying that I've been part of a partnership model. Unless you actually integrate 
the diasporic community into the actual teaching program. And you can't do that without reimagining the institutional partnership. What I'm trying to ask for is that we move away from notions of diasporic tourism to serious academic partnerships. And that's a fundamental shift that has to happen. And frankly, we're lying to ourselves if we don't confront this conversation. The third thing that I was going to address was uh, the in academic institute. And I, I mean, the African Institute, I can't resist this, uh, you know, by saying, you know, I think what we, I think Brian's right. If the, if the institute becomes an academic center, it becomes an island. If it's a managerial and administrative center that is directed towards facilitating the integration of Africa throughout the entire curriculum in every single year, then you're talking something else. And we have to reimagine what that institute is. And finally, you know, uh, somebody asked the question, would curriculum alone address the, the progression of BME students and others? And I want to uh, identify what something that Funmi said, which is, you know, I use the term radical pragmatism. We need radical to keep an eye on the social justice component. We need to be pragmatic because we operate in a world that exists, not a world we wish existed. And if you want to address the, the progression question, you have to address the pragmatics of it. Do people have money? Are they eating? Are they living in circumstances that allow them to actually progress? What is the kind of pedagogy that enables them to learn through peer review mechanisms, through applied learning mechanisms, etc. What we have to have throughout this is what I call radical pragmatism. Radical, the eye to the social justice. Pragmatism, we operate in the real world. We need to deal with money. We need business models. And progressives too often ignore business models and resources and focus on, focus on the social justice. We need both if we're going to sustainably transform higher education. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. And please join me in thanking all of the panelists who have joined us this evening. Uh, Fumio Lonishakin, thank you very much. Brian Kagoro, uh, Firebrand as usual, Asante Sana. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mashud Asante Sana as well. Valerie, are you still here? Uh, I believe this may be your last public event as uh, the director at SOA. So allow us to say again, Asante Sana, and, uh, and wishing you all the best uh, going forward at Oxford. I know that there have been conversations that have been going on on the chat. People have answered some of the questions as well. This recording shall be made uh, publicly available so that you can track some of the discussions. Thank you once again, and uh, see you soon at some point. Thanks a lot.